I'm Stephanie, and welcome to Wine Club. This is the playlist where I drink good wine while I whine about bad books. And today's offender is The Wedding Night by Harriet Walker. So heads up, there are going to be spoilers in this review. And as I say in all my reviews, this is solely about the book, not about the author as a person. I'm sure she's a lovely human being. Let's go ahead and see what this book promised about, promised to be about, and why it gets a wine club episode. When Lizzie calls off her wedding in the south of France, only a week before the big day, not even her closest friends know why. But since the chateau is already paid for, they figure it's the perfect place to take Lizzie and get her mind off her suddenly single state. When the group arrives, it's as if the wedding is waiting for them. The next day, Lizzie wakes to find that her friends have drunkenly reveled in the wedding that wasn't, but not all of their antics were benign. Someone is set on tormenting Lizzie, and she can't figure out who. The more the friends try to piece together exactly what happened that night, the more secrets start to come out. The biggest secret of all, the one that must not be revealed, is Lizzie's. But as intimidating messages appear around the chateau, it seems that someone intends to pursue her until it is. Will Lizzie ever be able to escape her past? Or will it destroy more than one life on this trip? So first of all, I have to call the back cover copy. Lizzie doesn't know who. She can't figure out who is tormenting her. I call shenanigans on that because she knows exactly who it is. But besides that, the synopsis sounds great, right? The idea is there, obviously, but the execution of this was terrible. I expected so much more from this. The premise and setup is sound, but my God, I really, really struggled with this. I wanted to DNF this so bad, but apparently I hate myself, so I kept reading. The one good thing about this book? I took it with me on my trip to Japan, and when I was struggling to adapt to the time change and like needing to go to bed and get to sleep but wasn't really tired, I'd read like a page of this and I'd be out like a light. It was great. So thank you, book. Thank you for being so boring that you put me to sleep. The reason? The reason this put me to sleep? is nothing happens. Nothing happens. This book is not suspenseful. This book is nowhere near a thriller. It is boring as hell. An episode of Scooby-Doo has more suspense and twists than this book does. So not only is it boring, the writing style of this ugh, drove me up the wall. I just, I could not with the writing style of this. It was not my cup of tea or my glass of wine. Now, I will say, some writers probably will love the writing style in this, but if I saw one more M dash or one more, one more sentence that had more adjectives than nouns, I was going to rip my eyes out. Everything is so drawn out and long-winded just to convey the simplest point. The sentence structure in this is often complex, and there were times that I had to reread a sentence over and maybe over again just to try and understand what was going on. Because Walker will insert an M dash and a whole ass new thought and then pop back into the main point, but then get sidetracked with another thought and offset them by M dashes again. I want to say, I know for sure there was at least one sentence that had two instances of M dashes. It's just, what the hell, Walker? Like, I'm going to read some examples here because I don't think I've come across writing like this before. Maybe the closest comparison is uh, J.K. Rowling writing under Robert Gilbraith, like the Cormoran Strike books. Like, I can't read those anymore because, oh, Jesus Christ, the description in that is just mind-blocking. Like, there's a reason some of those books are like 600 pages because we spend an entire page talking about him opening a door. But let's see why some of these examples don't work. So I'm on page 37 of my copy. The sun settled into a low afternoon sky, as if staked there on a picture hook, throwing yoke yellow rays over the granite protrusions they climbed and the limey rivers they crossed. Effie felt her heart buoy, still a relatively recent occurrence after what seemed like years. Her shoulders unhunched, and her neck lifted like the stems of the sunflowers they passed. She could tell from the way the dust swirled in the light and the noise of the crickets through the windows that the air when they stepped out of the car would be a warm embrace on her bare skin. Not that she was cold anymore, where she sat in the middle of the minivan's back seat, 
She could feel the heat from both Lizzie and Ben's thighs, where they pressed either side of her own. Page 53. From the ground by the side of his sunbed, Charlie lifted a plate of cold meats and greeting. The local earthware was hand-painted with bucolic dancing figures and fruits and stages from lusciously ripe to deliquescent? No idea. Its surface fanned with slices of sauçon, crudo ham, and varieties of cheese so hyper-local, they were practically counted as next-door neighbors. And then even up above that, he and Iso had scoped out the kitchen that lay to the back of the great hall and come across an anteroom piled high with box upon box of supplies for the wedding. Bottles of the grape and grain variety, great bales of party food, one fridge stocked as though a hungry army were scheduled to pass through, Another full of chilling bottles, their round green bottoms facing out in uniform rows. Page 66. Effie swung her feet to the floor and stood, allowing the room a moment to finish swaying around her before she took her first steps. She hooked her feet back into yesterday's skirt and t-shirt, pulled them up and over her, then walked slowly, padding and plodding, as though bowed by age or infirmity, rather than the sta stacking sensation of shame upon shame that she was beginning to feel, out of the room and onto the terracotta-tiled light, terracotta-tiled landing. The house was silent, but, the, but for the holiday half-sound of light cotton cur curtains swirling on currents of warm air as it met the building's ancient coolness. A door creaked somewhere in a breeze, the sonorous timber of mature timber Oh my god, the sonorous timber of mature timber? <gasps> Only ever heard in old buildings, across flagged floors, with no plush carpets to guzzle up the noise. Outside, the tinkling hum of a garden sprinkler puttering water across the lawn to quench its thirst and the low, long-distance hum of an engine in motion, a lawn mower, Effie assumed, before remembering that she was no longer in the city. A tractor, then, or an airplane, something mechanical, whose buzz and drone matched precisely the one beginning to kick in at the point where her skull sat on the stem of her neck. She approached the top of the stairs, moving gingerly with her head down, shoulders hunched against the day, and its insistence on time passing as usual, despite a slowness she felt emanating from her very bones. The ancient coldness of the stone steps seeped through the bamboo soles of her flip-flops, and when she looked up and over the balustrade into the hall, she wondered, briefly, whether she was looking at a scene from its past, some great and boisterous banquet, ban banquet abandoned by lords and ladies, long finished their wassailing. And page 65. When she had walked far enough down the field to be out of sight of the rest of the house, Anna sat heavily and stared at the countryside, spread out like a blanket in front of her. She felt Sunny's absence in her empty arms and wrapped them around her knees. The almond-shaped face of her antique gold watch told her it was 6 p.m. at home. I just... Seriously? Was Walker paid by the word for this? The, the entire book just kind of reads... To, I, this was painful for me to read. I don't need that many adjectives and description to understand what is going on. Like, we can get to the point a little bit faster or use that sparingly to really set the stage. So not only did the prose not really sit with me, I also didn't really like our cast of characters. Again, nothing is really happening in this. And there's a pretty, pretty big group of people that we're following, but we spend so much time on the same issues that the main women have. I know Anna feels guilt about working and taking her stress out on her husband. I know Effie feels like a sad schlub. And Lizzie is barely in the story. She's the bride. Until she has to take center stage to just get the plot moving. The book just spends so much time on their inner issues, rather than creating a thrilling plot that the back cover copy promises. Like, there are other characters also that are just kind of there, but I don't really care about them. Again, this is more like a contemporary fiction with like, a few thrills thrown in at the end. But again, this is classified as a thriller. I, I want more action. I want more thrills. I just, I don't know what this book wanted to be. It wanted to be a book about women's lives and self-confidence. It wanted to be about friendships. It wanted to be about love and relationships. It wanted to be a suspenseful mystery. And it wanted to be a thriller. But it didn't know how to blend any of those themes together. 
I have to say, even the theme of friendship wasn't really done well here. I don't know why these women are still friends. They don't really seem to know what's going on in each other's lives, they jump to conclusions, and they don't really talk about anything. Like, I get that the book can't allow them to talk, otherwise the story would be over. But like, for this, that would be a great thing. So we've got our main cast of characters, Lizzie, the bride that canceled her wedding, Anna, a friend, Effie, another friend, and then there's Dan, the groom-to-be who doesn't really make an appearance until the end, his best mate Ben, who is now dating Effie, kind of secretly, but everybody finds out, then we've got Steve, Anna's husband, and resident punching bag, and then there's a cousin of Lizzie's named Bertie. Bertie serves absolutely no purpose but to become a love interest, a spoiler alert, of Effie's. Told you there'd be spoilers. But we also have Charlie, a friend of Lizzie, and Effie and Anna's from university, who brought his new girlfriend, Iso, Iso, I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm gonna call her Iso, because that's how it looks. I think this big cast is meant to, like, cast suspicion on who could be tormenting Lizzie. But I also gave up on caring. Like, there's no suspense in this. The story kicks off with Anna, Effie, Charlie, Ben, and Steve getting an email saying that Lizzie and Dan are canceling their wedding. They're bummed for their friend, but they're mostly bummed because the wedding was in the south of France and they would they could all really use a vacation. Since everything is already paid for, they still go, but they try and cancel any wedding-related activities. Or so they thought. They convince Lizzie to come with them, and she does, thinking she'll be surrounded by like the love of her friends. And Effie doesn't tell Lizzie that Ben, who is the best friend of the groom, is coming too. Effie. Sweetie, read the room. But I didn't expect much since, again, they tell the bride-to-be to go to the place where her wedding was supposed to be held, and then they all just basically take their own time away and are having a romantic vacation with their partners. Like, guys, guys, she just canceled her wedding. Like, Effie's with Ben, Anna and Steve are trying to reconnect as Anna is super frustrated with her own life and even thinks at some point that, like, Steve might be cheating on her. Again, we just spend so much time on these parts of the story instead of the thrilling aspects that I expected, given that this is listed as a thriller on Goodreads. We just go round and round and round with Anna wondering if Steve is sleeping with her neighbor. Is Steve unhappy being with her? Is she a good enough wife? Is she a good enough mother? Effie is all depressed because her last boyfriend dumped her after like seven years together and she feels like she's undesirable and not marriage material. But then Ben is different and Lizzie mostly just locks herself in her room for most of the story until the plot finally requires her to come on out. So they get to the chateau and all the wedding stuff is out and ready. So obviously Lizzie is pretty upset and locks herself in the room in her room for the first time. And then her friends decide to just eat, drink, and be merry. Like, nice guys. Like, then they're not even trying to keep it quiet. They're not trying to coax Lizzie into coming down and just celebrating her life. Nope, she's locked herself in the room and they're popping bottles. So then we get our hangover-esque situation where everyone wakes up not remembering what happened the night before. Effie even thinks she may have slept with Charlie and Iso and Iso and Steve show up together just wearing towels. Anna saw something last night but won't share any details until it's convenient for the plot. And then Lizzie's cousin shows up. It's, her, it's just so boring. Some vaguely threatening notes start showing up like, you deserve each other. The wedding rings go missing and Lizzie is just overall acting really weird. But we make plenty of time for them to go to French bakeries and make lots and lots of dinners. Cool. I also spend a lot of time in my kitchen. I don't need to read about it. I'm going to skip over the majority of the book here as, again, it's mostly just Effie and Anna complaining about the way their lives ended up, and I honestly just don't give a shit. The big reveal comes that the one who's tormenting Lizzie is Ben. Ben made Lizzie call off the wedding because they met like a year before Lizzie and Dan met and had a one-night stand and now Ben has left reality behind and is all, you're mine! Like, and constantly is telling her that, like, the uber-villain he apparently is. 
He threatened to leak sexy photos of Effie and Lizzie if Lizzie didn't call off the wedding and then pretend to be in a relationship with Ben. Oh, there's also this uh, subplot of Effie having done a huge favor for Lizzie when they were in college and Lizzie had a really like tough time after being broken up with. She keeps repeating this phrase of blood on water and being a thriller, I expected some sort of like cover up or death, but no, the secret is that Effie wrote Lizzie's final thesis or her pa final paper or wh whatever. Really? Like I get that at the time it would be a big deal, but it's been like a decade. And at this point, wouldn't it kind of just be hearsay? I just, it was cheap. I just don't buy it as a way to raise the stakes. And also Ben just becomes so over the top. It is ridiculous. Like he admits to everyone there what his plan is. And then Iso, who's an influencer, basically threatens to share his photo on her account, like warning people that he's a creep. And the other women stand strong together and then waggle her fingers at him and he hangs his head and, oh, I'm a bad boy. Okay, I'm gonna leave. What is this? This is not suspenseful. This is not thrilling. Like, literally, the ending of the book is, so everyone's figured out what's going on. And yeah, he's threatening to leak these photos and They'll be out there, though, won't they? He snarled. It'll still be too late, and everyone will have seen them. You can't stop me doing it. Across the terrace, Dan's shoulders fell. Oh, yeah, Dan comes back into the picture to talk to Lizzie. But I deleted them, he stuttered, and the hard drive. I thought another scrape of a metal chair on stone, and Iso stood up, and ha stood up halfway along the table, her dark eyes flashing brighter in the fairy light glow than even her, than even her many strands of gold jewelry and jingling earrings. Jesus Christ, this writing's out. Dan, she said gently, they're all in the cloud. He still has them. But don't worry, nobody understands how it fucking works. Right? Wait, you're an influencer. You don't know how the cloud works? Really? So then, anyway, they're all calling him a creep. And... So, a million angry women, Iso continued. You'll never get a date again once they know what you're really like. Give me your phone. Let's get rid of them all, you rotten perv. What's your passcode? Wordlessly, Ben slid his phone from a pocket of his shorts and held it out to the indignant Glamazon. When she saw he wasn't going to move, when he wasn't going to move, Iso gave a snort of exasperation and walked toward him, the swish of her pale linen sundress, the only noise but for the eternal cricket hum. Come on, she barked at him, and Effie saw him flinch, craven before Iso despite craven before Iso despite towering over her. What's your passcode? He gave it to her, and she began flitting around the screen of his phone, nodding and tisking gently to herself as she worked. Swiping and clicking, highlighting, moving to trash, emptying and restoring factory settings until there was nothing of Effie or Lizzie or even Ben himself, left on the phone or stored in the cloud. Iso handed it back to him. Fuck you, she said politely as he took it from her. Anna burst into applause. Lizzie gave a whoop and rushed to hug her. Effie, trembling, gripped the back of the chair where she stood and wept with gratitude, her every limb shaking with the audaciousness of ISO save. I had a feeling I was punching above my weight, Charlie drawled, happily tone deaf as ever and glowing with adoration. Without a doubt, Chaz, Effie laughed, though un through uncontrollable tears. Without a doubt. That, that's it? So this guy who's like a super villain just... Mm, okay, you're right. I'm wrong. Then after that, we get a super hallmarky ending with everyone popping champagne and dancing and laughing and just having a grand old time. Anna and Steve are happy. Effie is now with Lizzie's cousin, which makes no sense. And Lizzie and Dan are back together as Dan figured out what was going on and came to save Lizzie. Like, you guys, I can't. I just, I can't. I honestly thought Spoiler Alert would be the worst book that I read this year, and this one shoved that right out of the way and took its place. Honestly, this is just bad, and this was hard to read. I, I would not recommend this, as I just flat out think it was not good. But I would especially not recommend this if anything related to an ED is a trigger for you. There is also a mention of a miscarriage, I believe. It was, that mention was very vague. And I actually wasn't quite sure if it was that or something else. 
So if that's a trigger for you, you probably want to stay away from this for that reason as well. Again, very vague, but not like, this book is not worth reading. I mean, truly, just stay away from this in general, unless you're having trouble sleeping, and then it'll be great. I gave this one star. This just was not the book for me and ended up wasting my time. I honestly should have left this in Japan and brought home another souvenir in its place. So please tell me, what thrillers with like a vacation-y vibe have you read that you actually enjoyed? Please share your recommendation in the comments below. Otherwise, thanks so much for joining me at Wine Club. Music